All right, so this is the evening of day 11. Watching these two red tail catfish grow. First thing I'm gonna do is unplug the pump. And one thing I noticed today, which is kind of interesting, I did a water change yesterday. And since the water change, I see some stuff floating on top of the water. It looks like some of the old blood worms which usually they don't float and we got a spider <laughs> spider looks like the spider drowned in here definitely don't want a spider on my arm it's just kind of weird that this stuff is floating i don't know if it's from the water change but that was kind of interesting all right, so let's see if we have two catfish in here. They usually hug up around this. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, I got to go deep. Uh, ooh, wow, look at how big he is. <laughs> wow, uh, that's kind of surprising how big that one is already. All right, where's this other one? Oh, look, this is where they like to hide. Check it out. Under the handle. <laughs> How weird is that? Right under the handle. And if I pull him out, yeah, he'll go down. These guys are growing super fast just in the little bit of time I've had them. So as far as um, the growth rate of these, so some people say that the growth rate on these are like an inch every week. <laughs> they get super fast, super big, super fast. Oh, I just turned my net inside out. I had all that junk in there. Oh, I got to catch it all again. And uh, so I've been kind of having a hard time trying to get a good idea of documenting as far as how fast these guys are growing. Ooh, I got to go deep. I, I kind of overfilled my, my catfish pond here. And uh, I got to I'll go all the way into where my shirt is wet. And it's really super deep now. Oh, I almost have to jump in here with these guys. <laughs> jump in the hot tub. So what I actually did is I bought a underwater uh, enclosure for this camera so I can go underwater and then a selfie stick to where I can get right down up on top of these guys. And then what I bought, uh, I bought, uh, they call it a quilting ruler, which is like a grid. It's like a 16 by 16 grid and it has uh, the inch has squares and every square is an inch. And I figure I could put that right on the bottom and then feed right on top of the, the quilting square where you can see the, the whole grid of the ruler. And then while they're eating, they'll sit right on top of that grid and we'll know exactly how big they are as far as how many inches they are. I thought that'd be kind of neat. Then we can kind of monitor the growth rate as far as you know more exact numbers instead of just saying, wow, that looks really big compared to <laughs> last week. Which is kind of subjective, I guess. All right, so we're going to feed these guys another block of frozen blood worms. I have a few of these blood worms left. It's funny. They, like, grab onto each other. Look at that. They're, like, it looks like they're pretty aggressive. Hopefully they don't, I don't know, hopefully I don't run into problems where they're tearing each other up. Originally, I just wanted one because I've heard reports of they can be a little bit aggressive uh, as far as territorial. And then I thought I, I thought I lost one. I thought one of them died. So I bought another one. <laughs> I thought for sure that first one died. And he was stuck in a rock. That I, I actually had a rock in here. And he was like in a little cave in the rock. And then I found this, the first one I had and I ended up with two of them. So that's how I ended up with two. And I think it's been almost 50 bucks a piece for him. So I got like a hundred bucks in catfish right there. <laughs> of course, you spend more than that in food eventually over time. And uh, let's see if we can get these guys to eat. They have to kind of smell that food before they start moving around. Otherwise, they just kind of sit there.
Looks like we have one that's a little bit smaller and one that's a little bit bigger. This is the slightly smaller one here. We'll see if he eats. Hopefully the water's okay. Usually if you have a problem with the water, uh, then the catfish won't eat anything. That's your first sign. I tested the water after the first few days. I haven't tested it lately to see if there's any ammonia or nitrites in the water. I probably should do that at some point. But according to the thermometer, it looks like the thermostat says it's 77 degrees in here. Looks like the heater's keeping up with it. So it looks like they're not eating right now, which is interesting. Give them a few more minutes, see if they eat something. All right, so they're starting to come around. The big one's really starting to chow them down like a little vacuum cleaner. <laughs> I think that's why he's bigger too, is because he's eating a lot more than the other one. Seems like he uh, has a better feeding response. I've actually seen people where they'll keep two red tail catfish and one tends to get a lot bigger than the other. Maybe there's like a, some kind of a dominance where one's dominant over the other and the dominant one just maybe eats a lot more than the other one. I wish I could dunk my camera all the way down by the catfish, but it's currently not waterproof. <laughs> uh, it'll be a few days before I get all that stuff. Before I get the little measuring gauge and the, the waterproof camera housing. Uh, I'm actually using a DJI uh, Osmo action camera. So I can record in 4K, 60 frames per second. So it'll be interesting to see how clear uh, the picture comes out underwater with that housing. But they're definitely chowing down. At least one. <laughs> I'm kind of concerned about the aggression between them. Seems like uh, they're biting each other pretty good. This is the smaller one here. But boy, they look really similar as far as trying to tell the two apart. I haven't seen any real distinguishing marks on either one of them. All right, so there you go. That is the evening of day 11. And I'll give you an update tomorrow on day 12. This is officially the day 12 video. So that'll be kind of interesting. We'll do some more blood worms tomorrow. All right, good morning. Today's the morning of day 12. I just had my breakfast. <laughs> so we're gonna take a look at these catfish here. Unplug the pump. Actually just did a quick count on my uh, blood worms. It looks like I have uh, 16 blood worm blocks left. So that should be good for eight days. All right, so this thing, <laughs> it's kind of at a weird angle. I don't want to crunch my catfish here. They like to hang out underneath this filter. All right, there he is. I see one on the bottom. I see one under the handle. <laughs> He's gonna get stuck in there. Let's take a look at him. He's like hanging out kind of at an angle right in the right in the handle uh, where did he go oh there he is all right so we have we still have two red tail catfish i was wondering are they going to survive in here are they going to stay alive all right so today we're going to feed them a little bit of blood worms a little block of Frozen blood worms. Today I was thinking about doing something a little bit different. I was actually looking at my analytics here on my YouTube channel and it seems like 
compared to all my other YouTube channels, it seems like a lot of people are subscribing to this because they want to see the catfish every single day. <laughs> and most of the people are out of the country versus, you know, being here in the United States. And uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. If you look at all my different YouTube channels, they're all a little bit different as far as, you know, like my motorcycle channel, I'd say it's like 99% not subscribed because you, d you don't really want to subscribe for all the different motorcycle reviews. You just want the one certain one. And then this one, it seems like people want to subscribe because they want to check out the, uh, the daily growth of the catfish. So I'd say it's a more subscribable channel, I guess. So I thought today, since I'm getting a lot of people subscribing, watching me every single day, I thought I'd do kind of like a tour of all my different animals here at the farm. And check out these guys. They are munching down right away in the morning. That's pretty awesome. Usually they don't eat that aggressively unless it's in the evening. They're definitely getting used to this little hot tub catfish pond. <laughs> so yeah, I thought it'd be kind of interesting. I've, so as far as work, I actually work from home. Most of my money comes from the sale of all my animals and animal products here around the farm. And from YouTube, uh, a big portion of my income comes from my YouTube channels, from the advertisements. Uh, over on YouTube, the the AdSense, the ad. So every time you see an ad in one of my uh, YouTube videos, I make like one penny. <laughs> so I have to I have to have a lot of ads in order to get uh, significant money from my uh, from my YouTube channels. But I want to try to make a video. I, I think I'll just bring the camera with me all day. It's it's kind of an interesting life doing this. You know, it's. it's uh, sometimes, you know, I make a lot of money on certain animals and sometimes I'll have like a long stretch where I won't make much money. I have to figure out how to come up with more money being on my own without an employer. <laughs> it's not like you have a regular paycheck that deposits in your bank. So it's, it's, you have to kind of get creative on a lot of this stuff. So I thought today I'd start with the catfish, which is, I mean, this, that's the focus of this, this channel. Oh, look, he's coming up the ledge. That's interesting. And then, uh, boy, those guys are getting pretty big. And then I'll just go through some of my other animals and some of the stuff I'm doing around the, the farm here during the day. I th think it'd be kind of interesting. Uh, if you want to see what I do, my, I think my life is kind of crazy compared to most. <laughs> I don't know anyone who does what I do. So uh, I'm going to jump from here with these catfish. I actually have two more aquariums. I want to show you those. And I'll just kind of take you through my daily chores as I go through the day. I think it'll be kind of interesting. First stop will be the African Cichlid Aquarium. I have a really awesome tank up in my living room. I want to show you that next. All right, so this is my 125. These fish are really smart. Look, they know I have a camera. <laughs> they are super smart. That's what I do. So I lift up one light up on top of the other. I tried to get a whole bunch of different lights on this tank to kind of simulate a metal haline. I have four different bulbs on there. I have a, a, a 10,000, a 6,500, and a Tinic, and a couple of daylights. I have a 65, let's see. I have a, a, a Color Max on there too. And altogether, I'd say it's as close as you can get pretty much to a metal halide light. So take a look at these guys. I've had these fish for probably, I'd say for about 20 years in this tank. <laughs> pretty crazy. So I feed them a mix of flakes. I have to move my light to get into the, into the hood here. And then I have another tank. I want to show you that tank. So for this, see if I can do it with a camera in one hand. But I have another tank over here. So take a look at this tank. This African cichlid tank's really awesome. I have another tank that I converted from salt water. And now it's a fresh water. Uh, I've had it set up like this for a couple months, I'd say. This one is a planted tank 
with Neon Tetras. Take a look at those guys. Pretty cool little tank. And this one has the actual metal halide on it. I bought these Neon Tetras so small that they were getting sucked up in the filter. <laughs> they go back in the sump. Now they're getting a little bit of size where they don't get sucked up as much. But I bought, I think, 25 of them. I think I still might have 25 in there. It's a pretty awesome, it's actually a 14 gallon bio cube, which is pretty awesome. Look at all these fish. That big pink one, I call him Pinky. That's like the the boss of the tank. <laughs> He's like the biggest one there. So I feed him a little bit of flakes. Uh, this is actually the cichlid flakes. I buy the cichlid flakes like in a really big container and I keep refilling this. And then another thing I feed them is these New Life Spectrum. Like little, uh, if I can get it open here. With one hand, a <laughs> camera in one hand. And these, this is kind of like, if, if I just feed them flakes, they, it seems like they don't get enough. So I feed them a little bit of the, these little tiny micro sinking pellets which is pretty cool they seem to really like them these fish are getting so big and they eat so fast they'll eat those pellets before they hit the bottom look at all those fish <laughs> those are, that's a lot of fish right there And I kind of bumped up the maintenance on this tank. I've been doing 50% uh, water changes once a week and changing out the carbon every single week. Another thing I do is I give them some fresh lettuce. I'll have to get some out of the fridge. I'll show you what I do with that. All right, so if you have these um, Ambuna African cichlids, they absolutely like romaine lettuce. They'll just plow it down within like five minutes. They'll be like completely... Nothing left of this romaine lettuce. It's pretty amazing. So I'll put that in there. Let me put my lid back together. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of lights on this tank that it looks really cool, but it's a little bit complicated to get into it. I kind of wish I had a canopy up on this, but yeah, they absolutely love that. The only problem with the lettuce is it's really super messy. It puts a whole bunch of stuff in the, uh, in the water. We got a lot of a lot of stuff just float. You can see a lot of stuff just floating around. And I have this little quick filter over here. Uh, I replace that filter like every few days because it sucks up all the lettuce and all the waste. <laughs> but yeah, it's working really good with the lettuce. All right, let's take a look at these fish. If I can get them without scaring them, they are. <laughs> they know that the camera's there. All right, so next up to take care of is my tortoise. This is Speedy. He is my Greek tortoise. And he eats lettuce, carrots, and uh, kind of like a tortoise pellet soaked in water. With a little bit of calcium powder. And then I put his water. You have to, one thing you have to watch in these tortoise is that the water's not too deep to where they'll drown in it. Put that in the back. Look at this guy. He's so cute. And there's a little heat light. The other thing I have is a Pac-Man frog in here. This guy's coming out of hibernation. <laughs> kind of waking up a little bit, but... He still hasn't eaten for like a couple months. I like to have a couple things of water in here to kind of uh, kind of dry him off a little bit. Take a look at this guy. It's a big, huge green Pac-Man frog. He is really big. He's pretty awesome. I've had him for a long time. He eats dubia roaches. Once he starts eating, he'll eat like five a week. It's pretty crazy. 
All right, so next up on the list, what I do every day. <laughs> I guess I'll just bring it through my whole day. I actually have these rodent racks with rodents that I feed to my snakes. Kind of like my breeder colony. So take a look at this. I actually have a whole thing of chopped up sourdough bread. I make sourdough every single day. I eat some of it, and then I always make extra just for the rodents and feed a little bit. I usually just open every little tub, throw in a couple cubes for my rats. Helps to keep them friendly. And I can kind of check out what they're doing in here. So these guys, these are all brand new. Um, actually, raising these guys up to have babies. They haven't had babies yet, but they're getting pretty close. So these are all from 2022, all down here. And then up on the top here, I have all my mice. And usually every day I go through, feed them some sourdough bread and some leftovers, carrots, table scraps, whatever, and just kind of go through and check on them all. So I got another rodent rack down here. And these are some of my older ones. These guys, they're super friendly. Take a look at this. <laughs> They'll eat right out of your hands, which is pretty crazy. These all need to be retired. They're like past breeding age. But sometimes they'll fight each other for the food, which is kind of funny. And sometimes they'll bite your finger if you, you're not. <laughs> you have to kind of be careful with these guys. Oh, I need another one for that guy. And sometimes they'll just hang out there and wait for their little treat. <laughs> all right, so now we're moving on to the snakes. This is where I make most of my money. This is my incubator full of snake eggs. These are ball python and reticulated python eggs. And it's actually the, the, breed, the laying season right now where my ball pythons are laying eggs. So I have to go through and check all my ball pythons to see if they have any eggs, which is the next thing. All right, so I'm here in my reptile room. And most of these tubs, have snakes in them. So what I do is I just go through, do a quick look. Only takes just a few minutes to, first of all, I want to see if they have eggs. This girl's definitely going to lay some eggs. Look at how big and fat she is. Then I see if it smells bad. I go through and spot clean. And then I make sure they have water. Uh, the water is the biggest thing. Make sure they have water. And I go through every single day and just kind of check to see if there's any eggs, especially this time of year. You just go through really quick. I already check, I check these every single day. So I know I pretty much checked them all yesterday. This one's going into shed. I don't think she's gonna lay any eggs. This one is the star of my YouTube channel. This is Bobby, my bamboo ball python. He's a male. Obviously, he's not gonna have any eggs. That girl's not gonna have any eggs. This girl's been a picky eater. This one, I'm not sure about that one. I'm hoping this pied lays. Look at that beauty. Big, beautiful pied. This pastel, I thought she was gonna lay some eggs. And then she ate a rat. <laughs> Usually if they're still eating, laying eggs is a long ways away. And then I have my pastel spider desert ghost. She's a beauty. Hopefully she lays some eggs this year. But it's still early in the season, so I'm guessing not a lot of not a lot of eggs right now. And then these guys, I need to go through uh, and change the water and the substrate and all these. These are all my whole backs. Some of them I sold. Take a look at that crazy snake. It's pretty cool. Usually I do it with two hands, open two tubs at once. I'm just checking, make sure they have water. Definitely want water and all these snakes. I need to go through and change all the water bowls. I just got a whole bunch of uh, snake bedding in. So that's one thing. And then some of these might have eggs, I'm thinking. This is a bamboo calico. Got a little pinstripe coral glow. 
Pinstripe. I got my bamboo. Pinstripe calico. Clown female. She doesn't have eggs. I just looked through all through all of them to make sure. So a lot of these I don't think are gonna lay this year. These are my grow outs. My Corglow, this guy recently bit me. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. These are my triple heads. Trying to breed them at two years old. Probably too early. I don't think any of them are going to lay. That's getting close on the water on that one. This girl, she was ovulating. She's a, a Lemon Blast Scaleless Head, which is pretty cool. Oh, I want to check the water on this one. I kind of skipped over it. And then this girl, I think this one's going to lay probably first. If you can see, I didn't really bring any lights in. My banana inchy clown. This is a pretty cool snake. Fire pine. This is what I do every day. I just go through them real quick. Make sure they're all doing okay. <laughs> I just fed a couple of these the other day. Another triple head albino pied clown got a white snake people are asking me hey do you have a white snake that is a bamboo lesser it's pretty cool and i have this guy I'll try not to get bit look at that big old snake <laughs> that is my super dwarf reticulated python he's a you know, 45 pound super dwarf he's got water i want to check on him and then I have Lucy over here. She just laid a bunch of eggs. And then I go through these. So, so normally what my schedule is, as far as selling snakes uh, and all my other stuff, usually Mondays I sell my Dubia roaches, which is today is a Monday. And then Tuesday I ship out a bunch of snakes. And then Wednesday, uh, if I have... Duck eggs or chicken eggs, I'll sell those. And the duck eggs and chicken eggs are pretty seasonal. So it's just starting to get... Oh, look at all these snakes. <laughs> I have a lot of snakes. I actually have a lot less than I had before. I had like 100 hatchlings this year, which is kind of crazy. But as far as my... <laughs> look at that one. It's kind of funny. You, you don't be careful, they'll snap at you. All right, buddy, come on, come on. <laughs> I don't want to pinch your head in there. All right. So a lot of these are sold already. I'm just waiting to ship them out. Waiting for people to make payments or waiting for the weather to cooperate because it's early spring. All right, so that's pretty much it for my snakes. Just kind of looking through them real quick, making sure everyone has water, kind of pulling eggs. I just had one clutch of eggs so far. Uh, from the ball python breeding season. It was like two months earlier than I normally get them, which is weird. All right, so the next thing we're going to do today, if you want to come along on my crazy schedule, take a look at all these. I don't know if you can really even see them. These are my dubia roaches. I should bring some light in here so you can see them. But I sold an incredible amount of dubia roaches, and today is the day to, to ship out the dubia roaches. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in these little deli cups. I think I'm shipping out like 17 of these, <laughs> today, which is like $170 worth of dubia roaches plus shipping on top of that. So that's the thing I got to work on next. I got to pull out my orders, sort through my orders, figure out who ordered the dubia roaches and get all my boxes and my deli cups. And I'm going to, um, before I go outside and do my, my dogs, my chickens, my ducks and my cows and everything, I'm actually going to work on these and run them to the post office real quick. All right, so I brought in my light so you can see these dubia roaches. Take a look at this. Look at how many I have in here. They're like literally walking on top of each other. It is unbelievable. I'm definitely stocked to the hilt with these dubia roaches. And then I got this tank down here too, which is just about the same. So I definitely needed to sell some. I was like getting to the point where I need to sell some quick or figure out something because I have so many. Luckily, I just looked through my orders. It looked like I sold 1,600 gram containers. 
So that's like, what, over three pounds? Yeah, that'll definitely thin these tanks out. All right, so I'm here in my garage. Here's my motorcycle that I've used on my motorcycle YouTube channel. <laughs> if you want to check that out, but what I'm after today I'm after boxes. The more stuff I ship out, the more boxes I need. I buy all these boxes at Uline. Got boxes here. Boxes up here. So these are my roach boxes. Way up here, up on the top. So I need two of these. For my, I have two orders of three. These will actually fit six containers of doobie roaches for these boxes. I need these, and then these. I might need two hands to get this out, but this holds up to 12 containers of doobie roaches. All right, so I'm getting to the point where I almost need a warehouse for all this stuff. My garage is filling up fast. The more projects I get into, so I have all my Dubio brooch boxes over here. <sighs> Just cramming in all my rat bedding. This is the bedding I use for my rats. Look at this. This is all my snake bedding piled all the way to the ceiling. Oh. All right, so I have boxes and boxes of all this different stuff. So in here, take a look at this. This is what I also buy. These are my jelly cup containers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think, uh, twelve. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Sixteen. <laughs> That's a lot of containers right there. That's going to be a lot of roaches I ship out today. All right, so here is my final product. This is what I ship out as far as selling roaches. And I've never really been that much of a bug guy. <laughs> I, I just started breeding a few roaches and then realized that there was a big market for it. And I got one guy buying uh, like over two pounds every single month for a pet store. And I kind of package these like for a pet store where, you know, they could just put their label right on top, their label and their price, and they can sell it to customers. Just a mixed bunch of dubia roaches. And people are going crazy over them. I've just expanded my collection. I started with just one tank and then just recently uh, kind of ramped up to three <laughs> three tanks. And let me tell you, all these roaches, this is like three pounds of roaches that barely made a dent in my roach colony. I have so many roaches in there. I just, I think I only pulled off like two or three of these and shook them off into a bucket here. I shake them into a bucket, pulled out a couple that are kind of beat up i'm gonna give those to my chickens <laughs> and then uh i just uh, weigh them i weigh them put anywhere from like 102 to 110 grams i go over the 100 grams per container uh, up to about 10 percent more just in case you have any losses or you have any that are kind of messed up in there any damaged and I've been selling them like crazy. And it's really super easy. I, I guess I am turning kind of more into a bug guy, a snake guy and a bug guy, which is kind of interesting. All right, so it is the middle of March up here in the mountains of Colorado, and we still have snow, which is kind of crazy. So one thing I don't want to forget with these roach boxes, I'm still working on the roaches, is you definitely want to drill a couple holes in either side of the box. So what I do is just drill a couple holes for ventilation. It's kind of the same with snakes. You want to use a couple quarter inch holes on the box on either side. So they have some air during shipping. All right, so this is how I pack these guys up. I wrap them with unprinted newspaper. I have a whole spill. I'm going through it pretty quick with these roaches. Uh, I'm gonna put another piece on top and then close it up. So I actually have two orders of three boxes. So this box is designed to fit six containers. Uh, I must have to go back to Uline and get a different size container, <laughs> a different size box just for the smaller orders for like three. It'd be even better to get like a container just to fit one. 
uh, one container, just a smaller box. These boxes, sometimes these boxes are like a dollar a piece over on Uline, all the way down to like 50 cents a piece or something. But it definitely saves on shipping if I could fit them into a smaller box. All right, looks like I got a package here. And it's to me from Chewy. And you know what Chewy is? That's where I get all my dog food. This is probably my canned food. Looks like they have it upside down here. But yeah, this is, I get this stuff, this pedigree. My dogs absolutely love this better than any other food. Though the only one they really don't like that much is the chicken. But the chopped ground, it seems like it's the best bang for the buck too. Especially the beef, bacon, and cheese. Definitely a favorite with my dogs. And I mix it with dry food. <laughs> they go through this pretty quick between my four dogs. So my garage, I have so much storage in here. It's turning into like a feed store. <laughs> I have my, my chicken food, scratch and crumbles. Then I have my dog food dry. This is what I use. The Purina dog chow. Got my canned dog food. Bunch of canned dog food. And then this is a little treat for the birds. I use these suet packs. These will last like a week and a half for like a dollar a piece, which is like the cheapest bird food you can get. And I have some more over here. <laughs> canned dog food, chicken food, lots of food in here. It's unbelievable. All right, so I have so many animals that uh, I actually had to upgrade my trash service to a dumpster, which is fantastic now. I don't have to haul bags and cans out to the street. They just come down here with a big, huge truck. Barely fits down here. I need to break that down later, but yeah, that's one of the things that's really helped out is upgrade the trash service. I think it's like $85 a month or something. So take a look at this. These are my final products here. So I do live animals and then I have a, a label that says live harmless insects, doobie roaches. That's kind of how I ship them out. Need to head to the post office before I feed the rest of my animals. <laughs> Usually I do uh, uh, my animals first, but the post office closes at 5, so I want to make sure I get these to the post office before I do the rest of my animals. Alright, so this is like a true vlog style video. And if you're watching this from another country, yes, I'm up here in the mountains of Colorado, United States, in the middle of nowhere. And my camera's kind of freaking out. I think I have a bad SD card because it keeps freezing up and I have to keep popping out my SD card to recover my camera. I just started doing that like about six months ago. I always wonder, am I actually capturing this? I have to look at my camera to see if the light's blinking. <laughs> <laughs> so normally every single day I'd be riding my bike to get some practice definitely need as much practice as I can get because one of my YouTube channels I ride motorcycles I ride and review new motorcycles and some of them are kind of difficult to ride well, let me put this in four-wheel drive here so the more practice I get, the more confident I am taking those bikes out for test drives. And that channel is doing really well. It seems like a lot of people really like watching the, the review of new motorcycles to see how comfortable they are and how stable they are. So yeah, this is like coming out of, I'm on a dead end here. So there's like nothing down there. And this is the neighbor right across the street. And then, yeah, <laughs> I'm like in the middle of an elk herd, elk and deer up here, bears and mountain lions. You have to kind of be careful when you're walking around. And then it seems like, as far as riding motorcycles, 
most people are out on the road before I am. I'm like the last person. We're like in the, the snow belt out here. <laughs> yeah, this is like where I live. It's kind of challenging out here. So this crazy camera, I think it froze up like eight times today, which is pretty unusual. I think I may have to get another camera for my catfish channel. I'm like, oh yeah, this is on my catfish channel. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of a random long super long vlog on my catfish channel one thing about the mountains of Colorado is take a look at how beautiful it is here really awesome snow-capped mountains I better pay attention to the traffic so I don't hit anybody. <laughs> you get kind of carried away looking at all the scenery around here it's really beautiful and over here oh, I wish I had this land right down here because there's a, uh, they run their cattle on this land. It seems like it's the greenest pasture down here, right by the little river. It's pretty awesome. All right, so this is about 10 minutes from my house, which is the closest civilization. We have the Dollar General, a uh, little coffee shop, a uh, liquor store, and the Loaf and Jug gas station. This is where I usually meet people if I'm selling ball pythons to meet in person I'll drive down here and I'll meet them you can see my fuzzy dice in the mirror <laughs> kind of taking up my camera space not many people have fuzzy dice anymore I had to special order them from the auto parts store which back in the 80s when I was driving I used to have fuzzy dice in my rear view in my rear view mirror all the time all right so I'm gonna stop here Gas is outrageous, especially diesel. Diesel used to be the cheapest. I want to show you how much gas is. Luckily, I don't need much gas today. But my word, it is so expensive. Let's take a look at this, how much gas is. It is 459. <laughs> That's outrageous. All right, so this time of day, I need my sugar fix and my caffeine fix. This is what I prefer. Double shot mocha. And they, they actually ran out of my candy bar, my favorite candy bar, because of the supply chain issues and everything. So I switched to Reese's <laughs> for my favorite candy bar. So we'll get a sugar fix, caffeine fix, and head to the post office. Alright, so we're coming up on the closest city. I don't know if you consider it a city. It's uh, like a town. I don't I don't even know if it's a town. <laughs> these these little it's almost like a village, the village of Pine. This is Pine, Colorado. I think it's a town. Depends on how many people it's in, but it's really super small. There's this is like downtown right here, just one light. <laughs> <laughs> so there's basically not much here there's a little country store over here a little bar and grill a hardware store and the post office That's pretty much all there is here and let me tell you if you blink you'll definitely miss these little towns that you pass through these little towns here and there you got a little like a strip mall over here and the post office is right down here, right across from the lumber yard. So hopefully the post office is open. Uh, I saw the school was closed and sometimes the schools are closed on holidays. That's the problem about working by myself at home. I don't know what the holidays are. I don't know when everything's closed. I'm lucky to know when Christmas and Halloween is because I'm not, not like with you know a whole company where everyone's looking forward to the holidays. It's kind of weird working at home by myself, but it looks like the post office is open where we can ship some of these roaches. All right, so I dropped off the roaches. They are in the mail. Uh, the funny thing is I was talking to the, the lady that, that took them at the post office and she said someone locally is uh, breeding crickets, like huge amounts of crickets. And they're actually using most of them for human consumption. 
And what they're doing is they're raising the crickets, drying them out, and making a flour. Cricket flour. <laughs> you can bake a loaf of cricket bread. <laughs> I thought that was absolutely disgusting. Ugh, that's awful. All right, so take a look at this. This is the street view of my house from the street, I guess. <laughs> so I actually lived down this little dead end. Ugh. There's like no snow all the way down and then you get to my dead end and there's snow. It's, oh, it's so hard to get my motorcycle out. Uh, I still probably have another month before I can get out. Everyone's out riding and well, when it's warm, today it's only like 45. But here's the street view of my house. <laughs> my cows are back that way. My house is over here. Even from my driveway, you really can't even see my house. This is my driveway right here. It's just a dirt road through the trees. How crazy is that? You can't even tell you're going to a house. And a lot of times the delivery guys will stop right here and just deliver stuff up here because they don't know what they're getting into driving down. So I'll put some little reflectors on the trees so you can see it at night which trees to go through especially if it's like solid snow and you don't know where to try <laughs> so you can kind of get between the reflectors but uh, the big melt is on we've been in the permafrost all winter long and it's finally melting <sighs> it's crazy so i got my cows over here we'll feed those at the end and then i got my ducks and then my dogs we'll feed the dogs next i got four big dogs over there that'll be fun let me check out my dogs my big saint bernard he's a monster and i park in the trees <laughs> in the forest All right, so here's what's left of the romaine lettuce after the trip to the post office. <laughs> they shredded that thing. And look at how shy these fish are. I come over here with the camera. It looks like a completely empty tank. It's weird. It's, it's like they're really super smart. I come over here without a camera, and they'll all come to the front of the tank. And then I break out the camera, and they all hide, completely hide. It's pretty wild. All right, so you guys ready for this? This is what I feed my dogs. Got one there, got one here. <laughs> These guys are absolutely crazy. My bunker dogs, bonkers, bonkers, bonkers. You guys are bonkers. Look at you guys, look at you guys. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. All right, see if I can get this gate with one hand. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So I kind of have some logistic problems with my dogs. <laughs> look at you guys, look at you guys. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. All right, so, all right, good boy. All right, so, uh, I don't know if I can do this with one hand here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Ah, look at that dog. <laughs> all right, and then my other dog, I just let him go. Woo! <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> And then I have another dog over here. So this dog, I can't feed the same, uh, in the same place as the other dog because he's a little bit slower, not quite as fast. Yeah, oh my goodness. Usually I put a leash on him. I brought a leash and a collar. I usually put the collar on before I let him run. And just let him run with the leash and the collar. But I couldn't get it on with one hand with the camera. But he usually sticks right right with me. This this girl's name, his name is Imani. Imani is a purebred Rhodesian Ridgeback. And I bred her with my St. Bernard. We got a whole bunch of puppies. And the other one that was with this one, that, that guy's name was Cobra. Cobra's half Rhodesian Ridgeback and half St. Bernard. And it's funny, she'll kind of like choke her food down. <laughs> she's so happy so happy 
She just kind of chokes her food down. It's so funny. But yeah, when I mixed the two dogs together, I was breeding uh, AKC Rhodesian Ridgeback to an AKC St. Bernard, and I got the 50-50s. And they, they, they look almost like the Rhodesian Ridgeback. And they're just a little bit bigger. Cobra's a little bit bigger. And it seems like he's a little more cold tolerant than this girl. And these two dogs, they're spoiled. They're actually living in a tough shed with a heater and an air conditioning. It's like their own little house with a little doggy door on it. So it's like a climate controlled big dog house full of straw for the winter. So these guys got it. They're spoiled, huh? You're spoiled. <laughs> she is so happy. All right, she's getting close. So I'm going to put her collar on. <laughs> choking on that food, choking it down. <laughs> she gets so excited and then she chokes her food down. And I have some random stuff out here. I have this little freezer I wanted to bring down to my barn down there, but we've had so much snow I couldn't get it down there. And then I have this water trough. I was thinking about putting my catfish in this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, don't pull me so hard. Whoa, 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 whoa. And then Amani likes to cruise around in the woods. You have to be really careful. Watch for mountain lions and bears because they actually have wolves up here now. Wolves, coyotes, mountain lions, bears, foxes, hawks, hawks that kill my chickens. Oh, it smells wonderful out here. You can smell the uh, the forest. These these are actually ponderosa trees here. They have a really sweet smell. You actually smell them. It smells like the. It's hard to explain what it smells like. Almost like vanilla or something. Kind of an interesting smell in these forests. And look at the trees up here. The trees grow like weeds. It's unbelievable. You just have to get through here and I have to go through here. I have to go through and I think I'm gonna have to kill like at least 500 trees because they're like just growing too close together and in the wrong spot. I can show you these trees down here. I actually knocked a tree down over here. Well, <laughs> stop pulling, stop pulling. All right, come on. All right, we haven't gone over here in a long time. So take a look at this. This is what happens when you don't thin out your trees. They just grow like weeds. <laughs> They're just so close together. It's like, it's not even, it wouldn't even be a healthy forest. To, to let them all grow. You'd have to cut down most of these just to have a healthy forest. <laughs> what are you doing? Wrapping around and around, huh? So take a look over here, it's, it's the same. Actually, cut a couple trees down here and it seemed like when I cut them down, all the pine cones released all the seeds. So we got all these. Wow. <laughs> We got some deep snow here. But well, look at these trees. Oh my goodness. This is like, no way. It's, it's, <laughs> it's like, I almost could sell them for Christmas trees or something. It's just so jammed in here, so tight with all these little trees. It's like, I don't even know what to do with these. So, what you need to do, I need to cut like 90% of these trees, maybe leave maybe three or four because they're just really crammed in here. <sighs> yeah, that's pretty wild. This uh, used to be a horse arena and they put wire on the trees to keep the horses from killing them. Come on. But yeah, this is kind of the crazy part of my property over here. <laughs> in need of some repair. I don't usually even come out here much anymore. I don't run any animals here. I used to run some animals out here, but the problem is, is at night, you get a lot of predators coming up. Just from these fences, it'll, they'll terrorize your animals until your animals are like really super skittish and flighty. It's not even worth putting animals in here with this kind of a fence. 
but oh started to walk in this deep snow <laughs> everything's finally thawing out it used to be all deep snow in here up until the last couple weeks <sighs> all right i can feel spring coming <laughs> i got my wood cutting stuff over here this is where i cut all my wood for my firewood we had a problem this year with the wood stove I think it needs to be, I think our chimney needs to be cleaned because we're getting kind of like a smoke in the house. All right, buddy. <laughs> She's so excited. This is our garden. I actually put a net, this netting over our garden. Last year it kept all the birds out. You can tell the winter completely destroyed this. We'll have to completely rebuild the netting on top of there it was pretty cheap netting <laughs> about the cheapest net and, uh, i think it lasted two years and that was it all right so i'm gonna put this dog back with that dog I move on to my other two dogs oh my goodness oh my goodness all right all right oh boy oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> That's the crazy one over there. Crazy one. Oh my goodness. So another thing I have to do with these dogs is change the water. You guys chew everything. Chew everything. Look at this five gallon bucket. I go through a five gallon bucket like once a month. <laughs> Look what they did to the bucket. They completely chew it. Completely chew it. I like what they're doing to their what are you doing putting your feet in there you put your feet in there <sighs> this is like a water dog she likes to jump in the bucket i like what they do to the their little tough shed they chew everything because this guy cobra he's half saint bernard what are you doing uh taking a bath <laughs> a big water dog there's my saint bernard over there when my saint bernard was a puppy I give him eight foot long two by fours and he would completely eat a two by four. The whole entire thing was kind of crazy. All right, so I'm gonna change this water. Look at you, you're so obedient. <laughs> so obedient. You mix a uh, Rhodesian Ridgeback with St. Bernard and for some reason it really increases the obedience. Oh, now you're scared of the camera. Oh, poor baby. Look, look, <laughs> baby's scared of the camera. How cute. So in the winters, I actually have a frost-free faucet out here. And what I do is I just carry this inside, this little adapter, which makes things really super simple. And then you just put the bucket there and turn it on. But look at that bucket. <laughs> they have completely eaten this bucket. And usually I'll keep going until they pop a hole in the bottom. And it seems like the Big R and O'Reilly buckets last a little bit longer than like the Home Depot buckets. But yeah, they used to eat them completely to the ground. They're, I don't know if they're getting better or not. <laughs> it's still pretty bad. And then I put quite a bit of like wood chips all around here. I don't know how many times I busted my butt slipping on the ice right by the faucet. I think the uh, I think the gutter up there is full of leaves or something. It's melting off and making a big slippery spot right there. But. That's pretty crazy. So take a look at my dubia roach colonies. After shipping out all those roaches, <laughs> it looks like I barely even made a dent in those colonies. Crazy. I have so many roaches in there. It's unbelievable. Now, the other thing I have to do later tonight, which I won't get to in this video, is I have to prepare for shipping out snakes tomorrow. I still use these insulated boxes. So use the smaller boxes. If the temperature is okay, I don't have to use a heat pack. And then I use the bigger box for, especially if I have multiple snakes or if I'm using a heat pack. With the heat pack, you have to use a, a slightly bigger box. But I have to just put the boxes together tonight and get them all ready for tomorrow to kind of save on the, the, the stuff I have to do tomorrow. Because it gets really hectic shipping out a whole bunch of snakes and putting all the boxes together. 
All right, so I have a couple more dogs to feed. This is Papa. Look at how big Papa is. <laughs> Papa's a full-size St. Bernard. He probably weighs, I don't know how much he weighs, probably over 200 pounds. He's a big boy. And I keep a carabiner on him. <laughs> He's a sweetie. He's a sweetie. He's a sweetie. Even though he's uh, he's like, what is that camera? I'm going to eat it. I'm going to eat it. Yeah, he's kind of aggressive, I guess, if, if you don't know him. Where's your bowl? Where's your bowl? Where's your bowl? Huh? Where's your bowl? Where's your bowl? <laughs> Where's your bowl? Ah, there's your bowl. All right, come over here. Right, good boy. Good boy. All right, I always make him sit. There you go. He doesn't eat quite as fast as the other ones. And then this girl, this girl, she will bite you. <laughs> Look at her drool all over the place. Uh, so the story with this girl is I raised a puppy and I gave it away, sold it. Uh-oh. What's going on? Uh-oh. That's not good. <laughs> so what's wrong with the fence? Ah, da, 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 da. All right. Oh no. Uh, I actually had the. At one point. Oh, let me get this carabiner back up. Oh! At one point, the hinge broke on this gate and I had to weld it back together. Feels like it might be breaking again. Look at you. All right, let's come over here. Come over here. Right over here. Right over here. Right here. Sit. Good girl. All right. All right. Good girl. All right, yeah, so the story on that dog, uh, <laughs> her name is Nala. I actually sold that dog and she came back and she was, it's funny because they kept her away from other dogs. So she, she was friendly towards people, but not other dogs. And then when I put her in here between all my other dogs, <laughs> she went ballistic, super mean towards my other dogs for the first few months, I'd say. Now she's getting to the point where she tolerates the other dogs. She's very friendly towards people, but she's just, I don't know, she's a, a project that I'm working on. I'm trying to get her familiar. The problem is, is she's not fixed and he's not fixed. So if I let them all run together, she would get pregnant. Uh, Amani, she would get pregnant because she's not fixed. Then I'd end up with a lot of dogs. So I can't run them together. And this guy is so big. And he's like one big horn dog. He's like trying to hump everything. And he hurts the other dogs because he's like twice to three times as big as the other dogs. So it's logistics. I just have to keep them separated. I was hoping at one point to run this dog with these other two. I could open this door here and let them all run together. But she's still really super aggressive towards these other dogs. So for now, I'm keeping them all separated. I'm hoping at some point I can run these three together. But there's no hope for Papa. <laughs> no hope for Papa. He's going to be a lone dog, I think, just because he's so big. So th this is pretty funny. I actually have one dog that chews absolutely everything. Cobra eats everything from the ground up. <laughs> he eats the buckets. And then I have two dogs over here, not a single bite mark out of either one of these. They're not chewing at all, which is kind of interesting. So after I feed these dogs, I give them love and attention. Go on, go on. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> Oh, look, oh, you're all wet. Why are you all wet? Did you lay in a puddle? Oh my goodness, you're all soaking wet. Oh my goodness. Oh. And this one's still kind of unpredictable, I'd say. Because he'll go from being petted and loving, uh, running and growling and barking after the other dogs. So I don't want to get that mouth, <laughs> I don't want to get that mouth too close to my face. This is the only dog I don't really trust because she can snap from being really super friendly to being really super mean, but I'm trying to calm her down. 
trying to get her to where she's not too bad got a little calf hut here for her she spends the winter in here when it gets cold i throw a couple more bales of straw in there she's been doing good doing good huh oh nala she's a good dog And here's Obedient Chicote, <laughs> And he's always carrying his bowl usually, so it was kind of unusual earlier for him not to have his bowl in his mouth. Seems like when he's not carrying his bowl, he gets really anxious, like he doesn't know how to act, which is pretty weird, huh? Look at you. And you just want loveys. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Look at you. Look at you. Oh, look. Look at Papa. Look at Papa. Oh, he just like begs for the petting. So you can sit here and pet him all day. <laughs> this is my most lovey dog. It's like, oh, that's all he wants is to be petted. Non-stop. Oh. oh my goodness. Look at you. Look at you. Look at you. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. Look at you. Look at you. Just begs for the pettings. Oh boy. Oh boy. So funny, they all have their different personalities. <laughs> yeah, this guy is pretty awesome. He's getting pretty old too. They don't live very long. He's got a couple years left, I'd say. A couple good years. Pretty good. The only thing that I'm having problems with him is he keeps chewing his foot. He's got a foot that he keeps chewing. That kind of gets raw. In the back here, every now and then I have to put some ointment on his foot. Looks like it's doing pretty good though. Still chews on it, it's all wet. <laughs> I don't know why he chews on his, why do you chew on your foot, huh? Why do you chew? Crazy dog, look at you, look at you, oh. All right, so we're gonna move on to, let's see, let me get my gloves on here. The next thing is this hose, my chicken hose. My, oh, it's actually a duck hose. <laughs> All right, so this is my wintertime upper body workout. Let's see if I can do it with one hand with a camera in my other hand. And that is running the hose up to the chickens. I thought about getting uh, someone to come in here and do an underground line instead of carrying this hose back and forth. Of course, I get weak. But I didn't carry this every single day. All right, maybe it won't work with one hand. <laughs> All right, it's not gonna work. I have to unwrap it with one hand. Maybe it'll work. All right. All right, maybe not. All right, I'm gonna put the camera on hold, but on standby for a second. Hold on. All right, so here is the duck hose turn that valve on i'll show you how far the the hose is <laughs> in the summertime i can leave this hose out just in the winter time i have to drag it in it's not too bad it's actually a really i, I changed to a lightweight hose so it's not so heavy the kink's pretty easy but it's one of the super lightweight ones so it's not too bad all right, we got the ducks and the cows left, and that's it. So what do you think of a random day in my life vlog? Bringing you along. I don't know how many people are going to watch this. <laughs> uh, we got the hay. Uh, I'm actually using a millet hay for my cows, which is, it's actually a German millet. And they're doing pretty good on it. Look at this, my water's finally melting. Wow. <laughs> I was like chipping away a hole all winter long in that ice. This is where the, the cows drink. As soon as it completely melts, I need to pump it out and change the water. Wow. It's been a crazy, crazy winter. All right, so this is a proper fence. This is a really heavy horse panel. Custom made, super heavy, the, the, the round bars. And then I found this free chain link fence that I got on Craigslist for free all the way around. <laughs> like hundreds of, 
of feet all the way around. And then I added electric. And electric keeps the mountain lions and the bears out. Definitely need electric up here on the outside of the fence. I've seen down in the city, people actually do electric on the inside. Up here, you need electric on the outside. So I have a couple things uh, that I brought up from the house with me. Got a pallet. A super light pallet. The pallet keeps the foxes from going under here. I haven't quite figured that one out. Uh, I was thinking of welding an extra bar in there. But the problem is if the snow gets really high, it's nice to have that open so you can open it with the snow. So I don't know, the pallet's kind of the easiest thing. And then this is the only break in the electric. Then you have this chain so the bears can't pry it open. <laughs> All right, so let me grab all my stuff here, bring it in. I always close the gate, close the gate. Definitely want to close the gate because a deer will walk in right behind me. I don't close it. So today we have a couple of roaches. Take a look at those have some that got beat up not good enough to sell so I bring them out to my chickens I have some lettuce some sprouts take a look at these I sprouted these from lentils kind of a supplement for my ducks and then this how cute is that <laughs> my little LED lantern I'll show you where I put my LED lantern Oh, those ducks. <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my goodness. They're like, where's our food? Where's our food? And then on these, you definitely need carabiners or the cows can open your gates. They lick it until it pops open. All right, so this is kind of a new thing I've been doing is uh, I'll actually put this on low and I'll hang it here uh, in my loafing shed and it gives them a little bit of light at night i started doing that since i had my new calf i was afraid they were going to lay on that little baby calf and kind of smother it so i started putting the light i could probably take them down now but i've been doing that since since that calf was small that calf was born in january <laughs> it was like january 5th it was like the the coldest ever for a calf it was awful but he survived <laughs> yeah, if you get ducks, keep in mind, they're pretty loud. Uh, especially if they're begging for food. Alright, look at all these crazy birds. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Alright. So I recently put up some netting to keep the hawks out. It's been working fantastic. Keeping all my ducks and chickens alive. So I temporarily have little binder clips on here to keep it all together because I want to expand it. I want to expand the whole area with more netting. Uh, I have a little carabiner. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. All right, let's see if I can get in here. <laughs> it's always a challenge getting in here. If I can do it with one hand with the camera all right boys come on boys and girls here we go here we go here we go let's go 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 all right so let's see how long these roaches will last <laughs> fraction of a second fraction of a second all right, so what do we got here? They don't really like these too much. They're getting used to them. Look at that. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Not too bad. Wow, they're really eating them up. When I first started putting them out, 
It's like only one or two would grab them. Now they're doing pretty good. Wow, they're choking them down. Alright, boys and girls. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Uh, they're all begging for food. Alright. Yeah, I started feeding these guys roaches for the longest time. I was feeding them buckets and buckets of roaches until I found out I could sell those roaches for like hundreds of dollars. <laughs> I was just throwing away my money feeding them all roaches. All right, so the first thing I do out here in the bird arena is to pull the water over. This is where I put the water and bring it in through the hose through the chain link and they need fresh a lot of fresh water they go through a lot of water so, uh, uh, see if i can do this with one hand <laughs> all right lots of birds look at all those birds and then I'll go through and rinse all these out, clean them all out. So I just realized my lens was really dirty. I think I had dog slobber on my, on my camera lens, uh, which is pretty crazy. All right, so I'll just kind of move these, this hose back and forth between those. And they get, they get this water so dirty. And then this whole area here kind of fills up like a pond. And this is the first time it's actually completely melted. So what I need to do is I need to go in here pretty pretty soon here, like in a few weeks, and I need to dig it out a little bit further. And then I take all the dirt and put it around the edges so they have kind of a, a duck pond here. But it seems like over the winter it kind of all merges together to where it's not really that much of a pond. And then the problem is, is you get all this runoff down in here and it kind of floods the rest of the, the barnyard which is kind of happening right now the whole thing's all melting for the first time of the year <laughs> it's like it's like a big swamp yard out there oh but it's so nice so nice out here oh my goodness all right let's see what we have in here all right so <laughs> what are you guys all honking about <laughs> they're all honking all right so what i do take a look at this I'm gonna have to bring up some more, uh, some more grain here pretty soon. I keep it, in, I keep it in the garage. Then, all right, guys, all right, all right, all right. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you guys are so loud, so loud. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. <laughs> Look at these guys. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So I found out a long time ago that I used to give these ducks just uh, dry grain. And if you mix water with the grain, they like it a hundred times better than just dry grain. If I put dry grain in there, they'll like nibble at it a little bit. But when I mix water, they go crazy. Crazy over that stuff. They absolutely love it. I can just watch these guys all day. So the white ones are Pekins. These black ones are Cayugas. And then I have some Muscovies. That big guy right there is a Muscovy. The Muscovies don't seem like they do very good up here in the mountains. During the coldest part of the, the winter, it seemed like they were shivering a lot. And what I did this year is I put in these uh, oil lanterns. 
in here. Kind of a kind of a twofold reason. And these are these are still full. They, they actually run two days. These are the Jupiter 2500s. And they'll run two days. They'll actually run three days on a tank full. It's pretty awesome. And usually every two days, I take them down, refill them, trim the wicks. And then, like right now, in the, the day after, I'll go through and just kind of adjust the adjust the wick so it gives it a little bit because the wick eventually burns down and then i have another little lantern in here so i can kind of work in the dark because it's kind of dark in here and then oh we only have one egg today only one egg yesterday we got five eggs which is kind of crazy can't believe we only got one unless they're laying them in another box here I don't see it but yeah pretty soon here we'll be able to sell these eggs so i'll sell these as hatching eggs and i'll sell them for like 35 dollars a dozen that's like one of my other big money makers roaches and eggs and snakes <laughs> and then you can kind of monitor the temperature right now it's 46 with a low of 30 which is not bad for four oil lanterns oh the other thing we have to do I have to fill this feeder. So, it's like the, uh, it seems like the Muscovies will come in and eat out of the, the, they like the dry better than anything. And the chickens, they won't eat it in the water. But the, uh, the chickens kind of pick and scratch everything. I don't know if they like one versus the other. So that's my chicken coop and then i've been doing uh i actually took this piece of cardboard down and then it got really cold it got like to negative 10 degrees and <laughs> so i put the cardboard back up so it wasn't so such a blast of cold coming in and freezing the chickens and then yeah if you actually look at the the temperature in here it's a lot warmer up on top so all the all the chickens kind of jump up to the high roost up there to try to hit the warmest spot in here. But that thing's been working pretty good. These guys are these guys are molting. Oh, another thing I wanted to show you. Take a look at this. Is I've been using this on molting chickens. I actually put it up over here in the corner. So this stuff works great if you have chickens that are molting, losing a lot of feathers. It's a uh, wound coat blue. And I had some chickens that were completely bald. Like almost like that, almost worse than that to where they were completely bald last year. And I put this stuff on their backs and within like a month, like three weeks, maybe it was like two weeks, they completely snapped out of it. So look, got the muscovy in here eating the dry. <laughs> the only one out of the whole flock. Just a couple of Muscovies come in here and eat the, prefer the dry out of everything else. Which is kind of weird. And this was eventually, originally designed, I actually cut this on my sawmill out of the trees that I cut down. And I originally made this as a bear proof chicken coop where you could put carabiners in here. But since I had the electric fence up, I haven't really had any problems with the bears. So, if I get really desperate, if, you know, something's breaking in and killing all my chickens and I can't, absolutely cannot control and need some safe place to put my chickens, I'll actually put them in there. Of course, this door is completely buried. I'd have to dig it out. So, oh, this is a pretty nice chicken coop. I absolutely love the net on top of this chicken coop pretty awesome don't have to worry about hawks <laughs> you know the funny thing is is that hawk he'll sit up like in this tree and every now and then he'll dive bomb this coop even with that net up there thinking that he can get one and i hatched out i think it was uh like 14 chickens last year i hatched them out and grew them up and put their growth every day i monitored the growth and put it in a video and by by this time like one year later 
uh, that hawk actually killed five, <laughs> killed five of those chickens. And unfortunately, they weren't all roosters. <laughs> I had to get rid of some of my roosters too because I ended up with like six roosters and they were super mean. So I actually gave them away to some lady in Craigslist. But she was going to use them for breeders, which is pretty cool. So then, what I usually do is just kind of hang out here. I have an egg in my pocket so I don't want to crush it. I just hang out with the birds. We just kind of hang out for a bit. And they kind of give me little kisses and loveys. <laughs> uh. Funny birds. It seemed like last year when we got into the breeding season, they were really aggressive towards each other and they're... Uh, especially these pecans, my female got really beat up to her. I thought I was going to have to separate her for a while. As a matter of fact, I did separate her from, I have two males and a female. What are you doing down here? Huh? What are you guys doing? Giving me loveys, loveys. <laughs> it's so funny how they, they're super affectionate. You wouldn't think a duck would be affectionate. Come over and give you kisses. Yeah, it's a pretty nice little setup here. Yeah, when I had four roosters before I sold them on Craigslist, it was really noisy. <laughs> I'd like a crow every 30 seconds. That one could just one rooster can be pretty noisy. This is like the part of my morning where I just relax from all the stuff, from all the hectic animal business of the whole morning. I just kind of kick back and relax with the ducks while I fill the, the water bowls. So I'm actually going to, uh, I'm thinking about expanding this area. I can show you where I'm going to expand it. This is a pretty nice little setup right here. Uh, let me grab my little roach bin. So this is kind of a temporary little gate right here. I was just really panicked over the hawks killing all my chickens. Until I got this, this is kind of all just kind of temporary right here. So eventually what I want to do uh, is uh, I want to expand it to way back here. I just got a, a little uh, alert on my camera. I'm down to 10%. <laughs> I do have a external battery I can plug this into. But this is originally where I was letting all my birds run over here. And they had this whole area over here. But they were running in. And then I started losing my birds. All right, so let me get this, this set up here. I got an extra cord. I got an external battery. We could plug this in and keep going. All right. Let's see if I can get this set up here. So we don't run out of battery power. All right. All right, we're on external battery. <laughs> so yeah, so this, the funny thing is in the winter is that this whole thing fills up with snow and even if I had it open, I don't know if it'd be accessible. Look at all the snow in here still. But eventually I wanna put a net over this whole top over here. And then I can, you know, almost double the amount of birds that I have. Or what I could do is I could keep chickens on one side and then ducks on the other. I can almost just keep them completely separate. Although they don't really mess with each other, so it's not that bad. 
And this, I was thinking about building this out into a proper coop. Right now, it's just kind of a kind of a rain shelter. It's like a. I actually had some baby ducks that I started in here once, and I put some some wire and something something still got in here and killed them all. So I kind of gave up on on that. And then this is the back of the loafing shed where the where the cows kind of hang out. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, ouch, ouch, uh, I slipped on the ice, ooh, didn't break the camera, luckily I didn't break the camera, I think that's why this camera keeps glitching out, is because I dropped it a lot, <laughs> I dropped it a lot on concrete, unprotected on concrete, so... Yeah, that's why it kind of glitches out. But so for this, I just hook up little binder clips because a whole bunch of binder clips seems like it holds, I think it would hold against a predator trying to get in like a hawk. And I don't want to completely tie it down because I want to get in there. I don't want to make a proper door because uh, I want, eventually want to expand this so I'd have to tear it off anyways. I'm thinking once things warm up and you get the summer bug of, you know, trying to improve things, I'm, this is probably going to be one of the first ones that I work on improving is, uh, let me see if this one over here is improving that little thing Ugh. and getting more area for these birds because they're, uh, they have enough room. They can go all the way around this, all the way in the back. So someone's getting picked on they can come over here and kind of <laughs> they have all this over here but it's i want to i want to actually increase my flock add some more eggs and this is definitely completely full for this amount of birds in here all right so that's the birds let's move on to the cows for the cows the first thing i'm gonna do is give them some hay all right so before we give these cows some hay I'm gonna give them a little bit of water. Maybe I'll show you the cows first before I before I actually feed them. So normally they can drink water right out of that stock tank, but I have I have a really small calf that still can't quite reach in the stock tank, so I've been filling up some extra buckets. Look at how swampy this is. <laughs> this is awful. Oh, it's like the worst. Is the spring melt. All the snow melts. It leaves all the manure behind from the whole winter. And I eventually want to get in here. When it, once it dries out, I'll get in here with a skid steer. And clean it out and level it out. I usually rent a skid steer every year. So I fill these so the baby can drink. It's funny, all the big cows want to drink out of those buckets too, <laughs> instead of out of the main tank. It actually stayed pretty clean. Not a lot of debris in there for being in there all winter. Oh. So this thing completely freezes up, except for I just kind of chip away. I have this uh, ice chipper over here. This big, it's like a big metal spike. I think it's actually used for like pounding in dirt around post holes. I think it's an ant old antique. I don't even know where I got it. I think it came with the house. And I use that to break the ice. Here comes someone. <laughs> That's one of my cows. That's my steer. My big old steer. It's getting really big. His name is Steer. <laughs> it doesn't really have a name. Oh, look at this. Oh my goodness, this is a nightmare. That's the worst thing up here is the... I like spring, but I just don't like the mess. The whole mess from the winter. Everything thaws out. Alright, so I'm going to... I actually have this... <laughs> Alright. 
I have the battery pack plugged in so we can keep it rolling. Keep it rolling, keep it rolling. All right, so here's my loafing shed. I built this out of my sawmill. I cut all the boards on this with my sawmill. Look at how many boards I had to cut. It took me months and months and months to put this together. And that was like over 10 years ago, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, big, uh, big, huge, like six by six beams. I'll show you my cows over here before we feed them. They'll probably be like, what's going on with the camera? <laughs> I don't know if they'll get kind of shook up from the camera. Looks like we're still rolling. Camera's not frozen. Got the battery plugged in up to 12%. Look at you. <laughs> That's the weirdest thing is I give them this millet and it kind of builds up in the feeder. And then what they do is they dig down into the bottom of the millet to dig all the seeds out of it and end up with a whole dirty face. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. And here's a little baby that was born in January, January 5th, I believe it was. So it is uh, the middle of March. So it's what, uh, two months? A little bit over two months. He used to be really friendly and then I brought him to the vet and got him castrated and uh he hasn't been happy since i got him castrated now he doesn't really trust me doesn't really trust me <laughs> he's a little a little skittish he's like ah you hurt me poor baby he'll come around though uh my steer over there was kind of the same way where uh he didn't he was really skittish and didn't really trust me and then all of a sudden he just snapped one day and was like the friendliest cow ever that's kind of how cows are and this is my big old bull, probably weighs 3,000 pounds. Take a look at this. People come over and they're terrified of the size of this guy. And he's, he's as gentle as a baby. Look, he's just a big puppy dog. <laughs> I go through all my cows and pet them. Every day I pet my cows. Just, uh, you don't want wild cows because if you come out here and they start going crazy, they can hurt you. And this is my calf from last year, my replacement bull. Look at this guy, yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, go, 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 don't eat my cord. He's friendly. Then here's mama and the baby, the baby's getting better. I can touch the baby a little bit. <laughs> he runs away. He's not like jumping and kicking like he used to be. So that's my herd. Four cows there, one over here. One female out of the whole herd, which is nice. Uh, at one point I was up to 13 cows and I had multiple females and then multiple calves over here. And it just, it balloons out of control with so many, so many cows. If you were on pasture or something, I could see it, but yeah, I'm just feeding hay year round. So it's not really that profitable, I'd say. <laughs> I take hay and I convert it into beef and the beef is just standing there. <laughs> I haven't cashed in on the beef. Every now and then I'll sell a live cow. I don't really process them and sell the beef. But they're just like big pets. I always wanted a big, huge pet, like a cow or an elephant or something like that. The cool thing about these guys, look at how friendly he is. He's so friendly, he's so friendly. You're so friendly. You're so friendly. Yeah, you're so friendly. The cool thing about these guys is you can, you don't really see these anywhere. I mean, you see them out in the fields, but you don't get up close and personal. And then in the zoos, you don't really see like a black Angus cow in the zoo. So this is like my own personal zoo with animals that nobody else has really, <laughs> you know? You don't see these anywhere. The, you know, the general public doesn't really have access to uh, like a black Angus cow where you can just go up and touch it and pet it and kind of play around with it. So it's, it's kind of an interesting animal. And they grow so fast. They grow about 100 pounds a month. They grow super fast. Faster than my catfish, I think. <laughs> 
It's pretty incredible. All right, so is this video up to two hours yet? <laughs> Let's make a two hour video. Just kind of hanging out at the farm, doing chores. So take a look at this. This is what I'm feeding my cows now. This is kind of the weirdest stuff. Take a look at this. This is called millet hay. Almost looks like straw. <clears throat> I just kind of discovered this recently because of the droughts and the high prices, just outrageous prices and the government funding of all the, the, you know, the cattle producers and stuff. You really can't get cheap hay. And I ran into this. This is like the cheapest stuff. My cows love it. And the problem with millet hay is it can have nitrates. Nitrates. I never really heard of the, pro the big problem with nitrates. So you have to test the hay for nitrates. If it has high nitrates and you feed it to your cows, it'll kill every single cow you have. So a lot of people are really scared of this stuff which is pretty crazy and the guy i bought it from said he tested it i'm taking his word for it that it's safe for cows but my cows usually go through like three leaves i put three in the feeder and then i'll put a couple more in the loafing shed and they'll kind of nibble at that too while they lay on it so it works really good for bedding and it works good for feed too and right now i'm paying like like 200 a ton which is pretty expensive in the old days but <laughs> these days it's, it's about as good as you can get and take a look at this my tarp my tarp is completely shot i need to sell some more roaches so i can buy another tarp to cover my hay because uh the tarp lasts maybe two years with those heavy duty tarps and then they just kind of get really weak and they just rip right apart they get just kind of fall apart so what i do is i take I usually just kind of measure off like five leaves and then tie it back and fold this down. And then I put it in my little cart and just uh, just multiple trips. I go back and forth with a cart full of hay to feed my cattle. All right, so here's a full load of hay. Put about three of those in the feeder. You can tell I got my cowboy hat on. <laughs> funny thing about cowboy hats i remember when i first saw someone wearing a cowboy hat i thought that's the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen and then one day i went to a cowboy wedding oh kind of stuck here and i was out in the middle of an open field talking to this cowboy with his ridiculous cowboy hat and i was thinking man that's the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen and then out of the blue, it started raining. <laughs> and it was at that point I knew why he wore a cowboy hat. Because he had his little umbrella keeping him dry, that cowboy hat. And I was getting soaked. And ever since then, out here with the cows, I started wearing a cowboy hat. <laughs> Look at these guys. All right, that's two loads of millet. And kind of the weird stuff about this millet, it's one of those feeds that when you first look at it, you think, my cows will never eat that. And then you put it out in the feeder, and they all just start eating it like crazy. They just absolutely love it, <laughs> which is pretty wild. Look at you, you're so friendly. And the funny thing with this, this is my bull calf from last year. And it was as skittish as that little baby calf. And it was always really super skittish, would never really come up to me until that calf was born. And the day that calf was born, this guy realized that he was no longer the little guy. And he is like the boss of another cow. And after that, it just seemed like he's like super friendly and mellow. And you have to be careful with two bulls. So I actually have this bull, which is a smaller one, and then the big one, which is probably four or five times the size of this. I had two big bulls at one point <clears throat> and they would fight all the time. One of them actually killed the other one, he ended up breaking his hip in the back and he was limping really bad for 
probably eight months before he just finally just fell over and died. It was really sad. So you can have multiple bulls, but you have to be real careful that they're not the too close to the same size. Because this one will start fighting the other one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny, the big one will just kind of fling them across the yard. <laughs> There's just like no competition between the two. They kind of have uh, like uh, the dominance, like the pecking order. And you can definitely see which one is which. So they got the youngest and then the next one. And then, of course, we skipped a year. I actually had one female cow that was born. She died a few years ago. Uh, she just bloated and died. I couldn't quite figure out why. Which is pretty unusual. Usually cows, they can eat even moldy hay and they'll be completely fine. And look at this. <laughs> look, even the little baby trying to eat the, the millet. <laughs> it's completely covered. The thing with this millet hay, it gets them real dirty. But every now and then you'll have one of the seed heads that kind of acts like, kind of like a little sticker. And kind of sticks a little bit. I've had a couple like on their head or their face where I had to pull them off. But that's why I like really friendly cows because if you have something like on their face, you can go up and pull it off. The other thing I do is I cut their hooves with a hand trimmer when they're laying down in the loafing shed. Some of them are better than others to let me do it. And sometimes I have to try like several nights in a row to, to cut their nails because their nails get really long and then they'll break and it can be really bad. And then trying to cut through the bulls, I always keep an eye on their feet. Uh, if they get too long, I go in and cut them. Like this one's starting to get long right in the end. They kind of turn up a little bit like that. You definitely want to keep an eye on those. Get in there and trim them. Ah, oh, buddy. Yeah, you let me do it. You let me do it. You're so friendly. The other thing he's got is these things that kind of stick out of the back, like this one right here, which is weird. I try to cut these off with a little trimmer, but they're really kind of a weird thing on their feet. Some of them let me trim more than others. Sometimes... I usually come out late at night when they're laying down and try to sneak up on them and do it with a headlamp in the dark. Works pretty good. Maybe it lets me clean them off a little bit. Still a little bit skittish. But you definitely want friendly cows so you can brush them off, clean off the burrs, spray any wounds, take care of them. I try not to have to bring them to the vet or put them in a chute. If you keep them friendly, you can manage them pretty good without having to get too crazy. The other thing I do, usually after the second load of the millet before my third one, is I'll come in here, clean up the piles with my pitchfork, the big piles of manure, and keep this around the feeder, kind of try to keep it free of manure so they stand more on bedding versus standing in, a, in piles of manure. So this is funny, I just had that, uh, that Muscovy right there. It's trying to fly. And they can actually fly if you don't clip their wings. And since I put up this netting, I'm thinking maybe I won't clip their wings anymore. Of course, if something gets in here, they might all fly away. <laughs> if something rips the netting down. Which is a good thought, I didn't even think about that before. Maybe I will keep clipping their wings, but usually these the muscovies can fly really good. The pecans, I've heard pecans can't fly. Some people said that the cayugas, the black ones with the green, those ducks, that uh, some people say they can't fly, some people say they can. I started out with khaki Campbells my very first year with ducks, and as soon as they were mature, they all flew away and never came back. <laughs> <laughs> so then I got more and I started clipping their wings twice a year. And of course chickens can't fly. Chickens can't fly. Look at that big old rooster. It's pretty protective of his flock. <laughs>
The weakest point for this whole thing is this snow fence right here. So this is just a really cheap plastic fence. And uh, I had a fox get in here a couple times underneath that door. And he's he killed, he pulled a couple chickens and ducks and stuff through and killed them. Kind of ripped some holes in it and I kind of zip tied them together. But I really need to get like some kind of a metal fence on the bottom. And it's only from like right here. I have some metal fence on the other side of here. All the way to over here. I tried these owls for a while. Those are useless. <laughs> the hawks still got all my birds. All the way up to here, I've got another metal fence. This is like a like a dog kennel, like a portable dog kennel. So that's like one of my last things to do. I was thinking at some point maybe tearing down all this kind of this junky <laughs> hodgepodge of a mix of fences right here and putting up some kind of a proper fence. Uh, I might actually, so I cut these trees and put the, the caps on for the net, which is pretty cool. But I might just put some kind of like a, like a horse fence or something, like a taller metal fence all the way around, which would be pretty neat. You can definitely tell that bird's still trying to fly over there. I thought, I thought for sure that bird was going to be able to take off. He's trying to fly. Last time I clipped his wings was last fall, so I usually I usually clip it in the spring and fall, so they can't fly away. All right, so another thing I like to do after I feed the cows is to stay on top of this loafing shed with their bedding. This is where they bed down for the night. And if you actually just go through here and kind of clean up all the manure, we'll spot, sometimes they'll lay in it, sometimes it'll get really bad. <laughs> Especially if it gets really super snowy, it's like a blizzard out there. They'll hang out in here pretty much full time. And then it'll get really super messy and it's hard to stay on top of. But usually if it's a nice day, they'll keep most of it pretty good right here. So not too bad. If you just go through and spot clean. Kind of the weird thing is they like to dig it up. And I like to keep putting the new stuff on top of the old stuff. I'll take this old stuff and kind of sprinkle it around and put new stuff on top. And it makes for a really thick bedding. And it seems like they like to dig down in it and kind of eat the old stuff, <laughs> which is kind of the weirdest thing. Those cows will eat absolutely anything. It's pretty amazing. I think they'd eat a sheet of paper if you gave it to them. So another thing you may have noticed is I have no heavy equipment, no tractors, no skid steers. I use a wheelbarrow and a pitchfork <laughs> and a little cart. I used to have a couple skid steers, and boy, not only were they dangerous, they would suck down the gas like you wouldn't believe it. And the repairs were super expensive. It was unbelievable how much the repairs were. And my skid steers, uh, both of them broke down, and I just sold them. I sold them broke down as much as I paid for them. <laughs> it would be nice to have one, but they're just so expensive to maintain. I knew a guy, I actually went and got some hay from a guy. Just bought a brand new skid steer. He paid $60,000 for his new skid steer. I thought that was absolutely unbelievable. Look at this stuff, gets in your nose. Oh my goodness. This, I don't know. If I could find cheaper hay, I'd get some nice hay instead of this stuff. But for right now, it's the best that they get <laughs> and they're eating it. Uh, nothing worse than getting like a whole load, like a month's worth of hay, and then put it in the feeder from to just stand around and look at it and not even take a bite. Ugh. I've done that several times. That is awful. Absolutely awful. And one of the last times I brought the hay back to the farmer. I was like, my cows won't even eat this at all. So I'm lucky they're they're all at least eating this hay, even though it doesn't look the, the greatest. And it seems like they're keeping on the weight pretty good. So they've been eating this for a few months. Looking pretty good for a few months on that millet hay. Not really getting fat, but not really getting skinny. Just maintaining a really good weight, I think. 
All right, so when I'm getting hay for bedding for these cows, what I actually do, that's what this load is here. So I just use the stuff right on the ground, especially when it starts thawing out like this. I take it right from the ground. So I'm not using the good feed. And I think I figured out the glitch on this camera, actually. On this camera, oh, looks like I have a scratch on the back. I think from the last time I fell. <laughs> uh, but it seems like it actually has a button where from the turned off position, you can hit the record button. It automatically turns on and starts recording. Seems like that's where the glitch is on this camera. So if I actually hit the power button, wait a few seconds and then hit the record button, seems like I'm not getting any glitches if I do it that way. And my glitch is where the camera will just freeze up. And the only way to get it unfrozen is to pop out the SD card, which is weird. All right, so for the bedding here in the loafing shed, I just put a really thin layer. Uh, I don't put it on too thick. And it's usually only in the winter that I put it on. So in the summertime, I usually don't put hardly any bedding in here unless it's really bad weather. And then they'll actually go out, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll kind of hang out on all the manure piles out in the back that I kind of piled up. That's really good, a really comfortable spot from to lay on a really dry manure pile. And I kind of put it all the way around the back. So a lot of times they'll go over there and I won't even have to clean up. <laughs> they'll just kind of move around them and the manure pile is just kind of hanging out. And I won't have to clean this, uh, this loafing shed. I won't have to waste any hay on it. All right, so there you have it. What do you think of that crazy life? Up here in the mountains, living on duck eggs and chicken eggs, roaches, selling snakes, living on YouTube money. <laughs> Don't really have a boss. Don't really have working hours. As long as I can get everyone fed before the sun goes down. So basically after this, I go in and edit my video. Uh, lately, I've been actually posting two videos a day. One for my snake channel and one for the catfish channel. And then usually with my motorcycle channel, that's really seasonal. I ride, I ride a bunch of motorcycles in one day when they have the demos and then I'll post a bunch of videos all at once. I think last year I posted maybe 80 videos. And they've been doing really good all winter, even though I haven't posted another one. So, it's kind of a interesting life. I can't say I know anyone else who does what I do. <laughs> Are we at two hours yet? Let's see if we can get a two hour video out of this one. Not that I'm going for a record or anything. <laughs> That rooster wants to peck me in the butt. <laughs> you can see his, uh, the top of the comb is kind of getting frostbite. That's another reason I have those uh, oil lanterns in there to kind of keep him from getting frostbite. And then this guy's one of my friendliest ducks. I think he's a little spooked from the camera. He usually comes up and, and uh, grabs my finger with his beak. <laughs> There's Bill. These guys are poking me in the butt over here. What are you doing? Giving me kisses? Kisses? Oh my goodness. Yeah, so I make pretty good money off of these uh, black Cayugas off the duck eggs once they start laying. I got two eggs so far this year. And usually they'll, you know, in the summer they'll lay almost every single day, all the hens. And I'll sell them for, I, I, sell the, I think I sell the ducks, I think they're like 35 a dozen for the hatching eggs. And then the black ostrilorps, the chickens, uh, they were a lot less. I did Khaki Campbell's for a while. They would lay every single day, pretty much year round, they would lay a lot of eggs. And then a lot of people started competing over on eBay selling the eggs. I had a lot of people selling the same thing, so you can make pretty good money selling hatching eggs. And that's another 
Another size box and I actually ship in foam when I'm selling those. I used to wrap them in bubble wrap and put them in uh, like shredded paper. But, yeah, it seems like I'm always shipping something out. <laughs> uh using uh duck eggs using duck egg money to buy hay for the cows or roach money now do pretty good with the roaches that was kind of a surprise this year i've never really bred roaches before and this year i started making some really good money i'm gonna actually expand my dubia roaches if i get a lot more regular customers on those so and those are definitely, well, I say even the roaches are kind of seasonal too because uh, if you ship them, if it's too cold, if, if the dubia roaches freeze, I'm sure they'd all die. I don't think they could withstand a freeze. So in the middle of the winter, I was taking a lot of orders for snakes and dubia roaches. And I couldn't ship them out until the weather warmed up. So that's the other thing. Uh, yeah, these guys are doing great. And from what I've seen so far, I have no inbreeding between any of these. So I'm not, I've been hatching them out myself. No weird crosses between the Pekins and Cayugas or Muscovies or chickens. I had a bunch of chickens one year and I had a, uh, I was selling them on eBay. I, sold, I was selling like a dozen a day. <laughs> I was selling an incredible amount of of uh, chicken eggs and I had some ducks too I was selling some duck eggs and one of my customers uh, wrote me and said hey I hatched out this weird thing it doesn't look like a chick it doesn't look like a duck it was a hybrid between a chicken and a duck it was called a duckin and apparently they're extremely rare to actually get a duckin and it was the only one out of probably thousands and thousands of, of eggs that I sold but I haven't seen any other crosses between them. Yeah, if, you, if you start making crosses, then uh, what are you doing back here? Mm. Found the bag in my back pocket. There's my buddy. Yeah, he's my friend. I can always tell he's got, he's got a different squeak. I think it's like a, like he's my best buddy kind of a squeak. It's different than in the whole flock. He's like the only really super friendly, he's like my best friend, this duck right here. He's a little shy from the camera. He's got the interesting little squawk. And then sometimes when they start clearing out like that, there's a something up in the trees like a hawk or something flying over that's kind of freaking them out. But it was pretty traumatic last year when a hawk would fly in here and just completely destroy one of the birds in front of all the other ones and they were so scared and just so traumatized by it. I finally got the net up and it's not happening anymore. So. Alright, so I guess I'm going to call it on this video. It's been a long video. That's pretty much my life. Nobody even comes up here in the mountains. <laughs> We've had one trick-or-treater in 15 years, and I think they were lost. <laughs> it's pretty secluded up here. Sometimes I, I enjoy just getting down to mail packages just so I can see other people. There's not a lot of people up here. Here's one of my muscovies. If I could get these, I actually don't sell the muscovy eggs because uh, I don't sell the Pekin eggs either because they don't lay that many. But if I could get a flock going of both of those, that'd be pretty cool. I paid some really good money for these the hatching eggs to, to hatch out these black muscovies. But the problem is they don't do very good up here in the mountains because they're more of a warm weather bird. It seems like they shiver a lot in the winter, even with those oil lamps in there it seems like they'd be more of a more of a tropical bird versus versus kind of a winter bird these ducks these these ducks are amazing these cayugas they can be completely frosted over with frost 
still splashing in the water in minus 40 degrees and they're still happy of course they run into the in by the oil lamps afterwards but they do really good in the in the cold cold weather all right guys i'm going to wrap this up this is not my usual video this is just kind of a random one-off on this one probably won't do another one of these for a long time <laughs> I like to do one of these once in a while so people on my channel can kind of look back at some of the stuff and go, oh, that's what his life is like. That's who that guy is. <laughs> that's the crazy guy with the snakes and the roaches and the cows and the ducks. All right, guys. Thanks for watching, and I will see you tomorrow. I'll actually keep um, doing the, uh, the catfish videos every single day. If you want to subscribe, hit the notifications. You can actually check those out, and I'll keep posting those. That'll be really interesting to watch those catfish grow every single day and get really big and turn into some big monster catfish. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.